you're like, you know, you don't even wear a one mil suit. You're like, you know, swimming in, in, a, in a nice lightweight bathing suit or something. So, well, it's noon and uh, it's nice to see so many people here from so many parts of our planet. And uh, really fun to have a, a nice group of hopefully uh, divers, some photographers maybe. Um, and because uh, Jake is both. He's both a avid diver, seasoned diver, and a photographer. So we're excited to be sharing our morning, afternoon, wherever you are with him. Um, so just a, a little, uh, you know, housekeeping stuff. Um, my name is Eric Luden, right here. Um, I'm the founder and owner of uh, Digital Silver Imaging here in Belmont, Massachusetts. We're a custom fine art lab. Um, and then Andrea Zaki is my business partner. Uh, we are both certified divers. Um, don't get to do it as much as we would like. Uh, Andrea is kind of a you know mile high city in Denver, so he 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 can't do much diving out there. But uh, and we're a custom fine art lab, and we um, work with all types of photographers to help them bring their prints to life. And uh, we're excited to be working with uh, Jake Stout here. So um, if you have questions throughout our um, event, you're um, you can put them into the Q&A section. Um, Andrea tends to uh, keep an eye on those. And if something comes up in the middle that is, you, you know, we want to sort of uh, might interrupt Jake and have a specific question about something, we'll, we'll get to that. And then we tend to do a, a little bit more involved uh, Q&A at, at the end. So we hope you'll have some good questions for Jake or for us about printing and, and, and so forth. Um, but uh, we're excited to host these webinars. This is our first kind of dealing with underwater photography, which is um, a passion. Uh, I certainly started when I was a young, a young guy with my dad watching uh, Jacques Cousteau and um, was just always fascinated with the undersea world. And um, so my dad got me certified when I was 16. It was my 16th birthday present. I did the same thing for my son when he was uh, 16. We uh, Simon and I went over to East Coast Divers here in Brookline, Mass, and had a great course with the folks from East Coast. So we're, we we uh, love those guys over there. And um, yep, we're 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 hardy New England divers, but we've uh, we've had some time down in St. John and, and a couple of other places. So we we've uh, we enjoy we enjoy both. So, um, but I want to turn the webinar over here in a minute to uh, Jake Stout. And um, Jake is a graduate of the same high school uh, my, both my kids went to, which was the Cambridge Ringe and Latin High School here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I'm going to let him tell you a little more about his trajectory. But I got to know him um, when he was the intern at the Boston Sea Rovers uh, Dive um, Festival that, I, that my son and I have been going to for the past five years. And um, He's going to hopefully tell you all about his great experience there and his opportunities and share with you his photography, which he learned at Ringe and Latin with his high school teacher who's on our webinar. So hello, Debbie Milligan. Uh, and thank you for encouraging Jake and all his work. And um, we're excited to have everybody here. And um, Jake has some photos he's going to share with you. And as I said, if you have questions throughout it, please feel free to uh, ask them in our Q&A. Um, and, uh, Jake, I'm going to let you take it from here. All right. Thank you. Uh, could you let the uh, screen I, share? Yes, I will. Sorry about that. Here we go. All right. You should be all set. All right. Perfect. So like Eric said, I started diving about three years ago. I've been a photographer since I was nine, so about 11 years now. And photography has always been a big part of my life. And I'd always wanted to try underwater photography. And I thought it was gonna be really, really, really difficult, technically heavy. And I found that it was actually came fairly natural to me. The diving was the hardest part for me. I had to learn a lot of skills for that. But once I learned the diving, it was just about the photos and bringing both together. So for me, underwater photography is really kind of a meditation and it's very common. And I love to share my work with people to bring them into that underwater world. And it's both a photojournalistic view and an artistic view. It's really the great combination of both. So one thing that I learned mainly through doing underwater photography 
was really what it means to make a photograph instead of taking a picture. I never quite understood that take a picture. And really to make a photograph, uh, let me see, is to bring together the technical compositional elements and conceptual to make great imagery. And I can tell you tons and tons of different examples of that across photography. One that I really love is this image here. It's very photojournalistic of Jacques Cousteau, the great inventor of the aqualung, famed oceanographer, invented scuba diving in 1943 and started entire generations of people into the underwater world. This image, it's a good image. It's a very photojournalistic magazine style image. But then take a look at this. This photo goes a little bit deeper. It's by Yusuf Karash. Karash is of course, one of the most famed portrait photographers there is. And I guarantee you, you've seen one of his images at some point in your life, whether it's in a history textbook, fine art gallery, a museum, anywhere. And really what's the difference between these two images? Well, there's obvious technical and compositional differences, but really what makes it better is their soul to it. You get to see more of who he is. You get to see the longing in his eye, exploration. It's lit a little bit differently, different perspective. And so to make an image is to bring these elements into it, to have your viewer connect with the subject differently and to see it in a different light. Now, another example, this is, these, I'm gonna show you four images and I just want you to mentally think about which ones you like the most. So this is image number one, number two, number three, number four, and then all of them. So all of these images were taken in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Pierce Island, and they're all of the same subject, Flabellina virilli, a really interesting nudibranch, uh, sea slug here in New England. And they're all taken with different cameras, different photographers, except for these two. I took both of these, but different lenses. And both of these are from good dive buddies of mine, Andrea and Steve, who both shoot with the Olympus TG5, a, a little point and shoot camera. But as you can see, they're all good images. Now, I did a quick survey of some of my friends. I asked about 20 of them, which one you like the most? And it was split 60-40 between images one and image four. Now, why is that? Why do we like those two images more than image two and three? Well, if you look at image two, it's probably the least technical um, technically good. There's a lot of backscatter, this particulate matter in the water. It's not a very good composition. It's kind of clustered. It's all right lighting, but it doesn't really tell you what the nudibranch is. Whereas these three images all have a nice portrait of it. This one, it's eating, a nice portrait with the rhinophores stretched out. Then this image down here, this, uh, I was with Steve when he made this image. And it was on New Year's Day this year, and the visibility was absolutely awful. It was only about a foot. It was horrible. Usually around this time, it's like 20, 30 feet at Pierce Island during the winter. But this particular day, the current was really bad. And I was surprised that Steve even got this image and how good it is technically. But between one and four, this is a very interesting photo where it's a beautiful portrait. You don't always see nice portraits of nudibranchs straight on with the rhinophore stretched out. And then down here, it's an interesting behavior. It's chomping down on this hydroid, eating it. All these little hydroids, the whole hydroid field that they eat. And technically, the subject is isolated in the frame, nice black background. So these two, are a little bit compositionally, technically, and conceptually better. So they make the image better. And really what I wanna get across with this is that photography is a subjective art, but you can make images objectively better through technical, compositional, conceptual prowess. And then these are just all the cameras we shoot with. Steve shoots with this one, Andrea, and then me. And again, 
a big misconception, especially in underwater photography, is that you need all this crazy gear to get great images. And that's just not true. I have plenty of friends who shoot with just GoPros and a little light, and they get some amazing footage or photos. And it all just comes down to how you see the subject. So I, I interviewed a few mentors and friends of mine in underwater photography and asked them what they think makes a great photo. And Berkeley White, owner of Backscatter Photo and Video said, in a great photo, the composition should walk your eye around the frame with a visual flow. And the image should place the viewer in the scene such that it seems like a person didn't take the picture. That's a really important point is that you don't really want your view to come in as much. You want the composition to show the viewer an easy subject to see, nice flow to it. For example, this image. This is an Arctic shanty in the very cold waters. I think this was a 34 degree dive in Quebec. And Arctic shanties are fairly common up there. They're a nice subject. I got this image and I liked it. It's a nice portrait of it. Nice shadow, you got this little chitin down here, a mollusk. But I wasn't satisfied with this. I felt the composition lacked something. And what I found was that it was lacking a good background. So I found a different one, a little bit more colorful. And I get this scarlet solace, a type of sea cucumber. And you get this completely different style image. It connects more with the viewer. It brings them into the world more. And I lit it so that you get a little bit of a shadow down there. So it mimics sunlight a little bit. I, whenever I look at this image, I always debate whether or not I like this green sea cucumber, I mean, um, sea urchin here. Sometimes I like it, sometimes I don't. I haven't quite made up my mind about that yet. But images like this, you want to push them and push them until you get what you want. Uh, same location, this is in the Saguenay in the St. Lawrence in Quebec. This is an image that Andrea got. I believe this is a flabellina. I don't know the exact species, but it's a little nudibranch, about an inch long. Technically, pretty perfect. The one thing that I think Andrea could have done differently, and I photographed it as well, was get the subject out of the center. Moving the subject out of the center of the frame oftentimes creates a more pleasing composition. For the viewer, it walks the eye around the frame. It brings them into the frame more, keeps them in the frame, which is exactly what you want to do with a successful composition. This one, exactly technically the same as Andrea's shot. Two very different cameras, same technical. Then I, I mentioned technical a little bit, aperture, ISO, lighting, that's all technical stuff. Looking at this image here, these are both Flavolina virili, again, up in Pierce Island in Portsmouth. I had a lot of trouble with this image. I couldn't figure out why I didn't like it as much. And I, I sat there in the water a little bit looking at it. And then I decided this is an F-22, so I have a lot of depth of field. But even with this macro lens, it falls off pretty quickly. I decided to open the aperture up. So I'm on F-8 now, a lot more shallow, becomes more painterly. So you connect with the subject, this really, in a bit different way. You get to see it in a different light, but you still get this secondary subject back here, just a little bit more out of focus. And it frees up the composition for the viewer. Now, over the past couple of weeks, we've had this amazing kind of a bloom, I don't know what to call it, a migration maybe, of these Northern puffers, which is really rare. And we had them in Rockport, Gloucester, really amazing. And these little northern puffers are natural. They don't come up with the Gulf Stream like some other tropical fish, but they're here mainly on night dives. During the day, they're around, but they're really fun to photograph. Kind of cute little cuddly animals, not great swimmers. And so I got this photo on a night dive. Again, I'm lighting it with strobes. That's why it's bright, not dark. And I didn't like this image as much. It's a good image, but it doesn't go beyond. It doesn't ask the viewer to consider the image more. So I got this instead. I got this maybe two minutes after I took that photo. The big difference between this 
is that I'm using a snoot. A snoot is a optical tool that you put on the end of the strobe and it angles the beam of light down from this big beam to a very small one. And it creates a completely different feel, a lot more dramatic. I love the way that the light falls off it on the back. You consider the eye more. You don't see any of the white in the sand or in the background. And so it isolates the subject completely and a nice, crisp, clean black background. And it's great if you're shooting in low vis in New England as well. Okay, can I add just a, it's a really, I, I really like your comparison and exploration of the two different photos in, in your comments. Um, you know, I haven't done underwater photography, so I have a couple of questions if, if yeah. I can. One is how, how, what lens, what, what, um, what, what millimeter lens are you using and how close are you? And then what's preventing these guys from getting startled and swimming away? Yeah, so this is a 100 millimeter Canon lens, EF lens. And I'm about maybe five inches away from it, maybe a little bit closer. A lot of underwater photography, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, is about respecting the subject and respecting its distance. And so a lot of times I'll go up really, really slowly to a fish or an animal, whatever. And I'll kind of create a trust with it so that I can approach it. And that's a lot of what underwater photography really is. It's about taking time to understand your subject. And it helps a lot to know about the uh, life history and all the biology behind them as well. And a little bit of behavior as well. Thank you. So another friend of mine, Charles Maisel, incredible fluorescent photographer said, to me, a picture is a simple documentation of what something is. I want an image to go beyond that, to be visually compelling on its own merits and to inspire the viewer to think more deeply about the story behind it. Thinking about a story in an image is incredibly important. It's photojournalism, but it's also art. And you can do this in two ways. You can have a photo series, which is more of a photojournalistic way, or you can have a singular image that tells the story of that one subject. And that's really what I like to do. So this was my first ever shark dive. And this is in uh, Roatan, Honduras. It's also the fourth time I ever photographed underwater. And it was very challenging. I mean, this was down about 75 feet. We just sit on the sand and the sharks kind of come swimming around. These are Caribbean reef sharks. Harmless, they don't care about you at all. They're only there because there's a chum bucket. And once it opened up, they'll swim right away. But as they're circling, you get photos of them. And I was there for a photography competition, the digital shootout hosted by a backscatter photo. And I really wanted to get an image that would be different than everyone else's. So I thought, technically, how could I do that? Well, I'd like to do a slow shutter speed. What does a slow shutter speed say about the shark? Well, it's relaying to my viewer that it's a fluid motion. Compositionally, it's placing more importance on just the shark. This was one of the images I got, and I actually wasn't satisfied with this image. I, have, I really hate the cyan color. It's too bright for me. But this image, and I converted it to black and white, I fell in love with this image. And this is still, to, my, to this day, one of my favorite images that I've ever made. It's clear, perfect exposure on the shark. I, I have no cyan, nice black and white few fish swimming around, sharks in the background, but the shark here is in focus. And the reason why that the shark is in focus, I'm of course panning along with it, but the strobes are hitting it and the strobes on a slow shutter speed will stop the motion. And that's why you get perfect motion here and then blur everywhere else. And like I said, conceptually, it's creating this kind of feeling that the shark is this natural, it's very fluid motion. And that's why I wanted to relay across to the viewer. So I was really happy with this image. Similarly, this is in the National Aquarium in the Atlantic Coral Reef. So inside of their tank, I was there when I was the Boston Sea Rovers intern studying with them for a week. And I was amazed at how many fish there were just swarming around me constantly. So instead of panning the camera, this is a second and a half shutter speed. 
And I just sit the camera down on the sand. And these fish just all came up to it. This is a pork fish here, some doctor fish, surgeon fish. And they all just started swarming around. All these kind of cool green colors swirling around them. That's from the long exposure. Then all the fish being stopped, that's from the strobes. And actually, if you look really closely, it's kind of cool. Right here, you can see a guy's face watching outside of the tank. And so this similar technique, slow shutter speed, but gives a totally different feel to it. Kind of hypnotic, crazy image. Then an image like this, this is in Monterey Bay, a, a bat star, very, very, very common subject. For this, I use a particular stroke placement where in, when I have the housing vertically, I'll take the right strobe, pull it to the side of the housing, and then the left strobe, I'll pull it above the camera housing and point it back a little bit towards the camera. And that way it's not lighting quite as much of the water column. Now, all the wide angle images that I'll show you are with a 15 millimeter fisheye. So I'm very, very close to all the subjects and a lot of that approaching very slowly. Of course, with a starfish, I'm not gonna scare it away. I liked this image, but how do you make it a little bit more compelling? How do you tell a bit more of a story? You find two of them. Always more is better. Sometimes it's nice to have a, one subject, but like with bat stars, if you can have two or three, it works a little bit better. And you'll notice with that strobe placement, I get a really, really nice deep shadow. And I can also turn the power down, change the power on the left strobe a little bit and get nice even lighting and then have a little bit deeper shadows over here. I still have a nice contrast, nice gradation to the bottom. Even have a little anemone at the kind of armpit of this that star. And again, very, very simple subject, very simple image that I just took the time to spend time with, get to know the subject, see what I like, see what I don't like. And you just kind of look and find a subject and work the scene. So now speaking of interesting subjects, this is a, a dead perch that I found up in a lake in New Hampshire that I photograph a lot. And this was in the middle of winter time. And I was swimming above, and I saw it below. I saw this weird thing floating off the ground. And I had no clue what it is. So I went down, and it was a dead fish. Some of my friends have uh, commented that for some reason, I have a lot of dead animal foes. Well, they make for very interesting subjects, especially if something else is eating it. And this, I thought, was a really interesting scene. It has this weird fuzzy kind of algae or moss growing on it. Beautiful sun rays coming through. I thought it was such an angelic scene of such a really kind of morbid subject. And so to have that juxtaposition can make for a really interesting image. And of course I do photograph a lot of the nice charismatic stuff like sharks. These are blue sharks off the coast of Rhode Island. Blue sharks are really fun to photograph as opposed to the Caribbean reef sharks earlier, these guys are really curious. They'll come up to you, bump into you. And at that point, the camera becomes a bit of a shield. You do have to push them away a little bit. And uh, it was my first time shooting them and they were very, very intense to photograph. I made this image in the hopes of getting a nice clean shot of it. And I did. And this one in particular, the strobes hit it perfectly, you get this beautiful blue iridescence on it. But what this image I felt was lacking was the real conceptual element, that element of why you really want to look at it, why the viewer wants to look at it. And I ended up thinking that it wasn't intense enough. It's a beautiful image of a shark, but something like this is a little bit more intense, where it's coming at you, flying over, you get this nice reflection of it in the water still can see the nostrils, the little dots, the ampullae of Lorenzino, all that sensory organs. And also you have this one's a little bit more layered. In the foreground, you have the shark. Then in the background, there's even a person standing up there. I think this is actually Joe Romero who filmed Shark Week. And it's a really, really fun subject to photograph. 
and to try and figure out what you want the viewer to understand about this. So when you look at this, it's intense. You see little teeth, but it's not incredibly frightening, which sharks are not that frightening. If you've been around them, they really don't care about you, especially if you're just sitting there. Blue sharks though, a little bit more intense, a little bit more curious, kind of like a puppy dog. So how do you show that? Have a little bit more overbearing image coming straight at you. Brian Scary, a good friend of mine who I'm working with now, said that a great photograph evokes emotion that you will remember for the rest of your life. Emotion is such a key part of photography and especially in underwater photography where I want the viewer to connect with the subject more so that they appreciate it. So with sharks, it's very easy to get that emotion because there's a lot of stigma around sharks. The take a subject like a freshwater colonial gelatinous bryozoan, a mouthful to say, and a really kind of uninteresting subject. It's a blob. This is actually an animal. Each one of these little kind of quadrants, I guess, are an animal. It's a colonial animal. So the whole thing is made up of a bunch of animals. It's freshwater. Their marine relatives are very, very different. Not gelatinous, much smaller. This guy is maybe five, six inches across in diameter. And I got this image. This was one of the first ones that I got. And I had no clue what it is. So I, I literally Googled freshwater blob. And it was the first thing that popped up. Very weird subject. But how do you evoke emotion from such a weird mundane subject? It's interesting. People kind of want to know what it is. But this doesn't do it for me. So I got this image. I made this image last year. And it's a little bit better. It's on an overcast day. I went out this very shallow. I bring a human element, human line as a dock. Then this nice kind of figure eight form of the bryozoan. And again, I'm lighting it in a very specific way to get a lot of contrast on the bottom and have a nice gradation into black. And this worked for me. I liked this image, but I still wasn't totally satisfied. So I finally wound up with this image. And this for me, this was perfect. It shows the environment. It's an interesting subject. It's backlit. It has a little bit of strobe to pop the color a little bit. And this tree, this underwater tree that fell underwater is covered in all this moss and algae. This is in late summer. And so it makes for this kind of ghoulish scene with this very weird subject. So when I've shown this to people, the first thing they always ask is what is that? Which is exactly what I want them to ask because underwater photography is all about sharing my world and the world I go into and visit with people who can't. So when someone asks me, what is it? I get to tell them and then they remember a lot of wildlife photography, especially wildlife photojournalism is about trying to have people care about the environment and you can't have someone care about a subject without first knowing it. And this is especially for a lot of endangered species and stuff, but bryozoans are no threat. So it just becomes an interesting subject. Jake, I think that was an astounding photo and so otherworldly. Like you almost don't realize it's un an underwater photo in, in my opinion, it really yeah. beautifully composed the lighting, as you said, um, and I like how you keep pushing yourself to, to, to make to, you know, that you're asking yourself what makes it compelling. And I think you do an excellent job of, of doing that in, in a photo like that. Well, thank you. Like Eric just said, uh, pushing yourself, visualizing, I find is one of the most important ways that I push myself to get great images. And I oftentimes start with an okay image or a good image and work to get that great image. And Minor White is one of the photographers who I've learned a lot from looking at his work. Minor White was a contemporary of uh, Ansel Adams and Edward Weston. And I think he always kind of gets a bad rap in photography. Not many people know about him as compared to Ansel Adams and stuff, but he has some amazing imagery. And one of his favorite quotes that he has is, I'm always mentally photographing everything as practice that visualization is such a key important part to underwater photography and photography in general. So 
I have a little, a little notebook of ideas that I keep and I draw some of them out, some of them I just write out. Now, as you can see, I get all the talent with photography and none of it with drawing. So forgive me for the bad drawing, but I kind of think about settings and stuff. This was a shoot I was doing for the New England Aquarium before the lockdown and whole virus and everything. I did articles and little blogs for the aquarium. And uh, my friend there, Dan Dolan, challenged me. He said, I want you to get an image nobody has ever made inside this tank. And my first thought, I was terrified. Because the only two people who've extensively photographed the giant ocean tank at the New England Aquarium are Brian Scarry and Keith Ellenbogen, two of the best underwater photographers in the world. So I, I thought, how do I get an image that they haven't made? And so I thought about it for a while and I came up with this idea to get a split shot where it's half in the water and half out of the water of Myrtle, the matriarch of the aquarium, this giant green sea turtle. And I jotted down a bunch of notes of what I thought it would be like, kind of composition. And so then the day finally came, I had about 20 minutes to get the photo and this is it. This was by far the most technically challenging image I have ever made. I did not, I was completely off on the settings. This ended up being like a 20th of a second exposure ISO 1600 on F8. And the reason why I had so much trouble with this is because with a typical split shot or half and half, whatever you want to call it, like say you're in the ocean, the sky is brighter and underwater is darker. And we compensate for that darkness underwater with strobes, lighting the subject with the strobes and then balancing the two exposures. But in the aquarium, above water is significantly darker than underwater. And Myrtle, I found out, is like a giant reflector. And to top it all off, the aquarium has this lighting system that is so, so, so advanced that it mimics clouds and storms and everything. And so it changes every couple minutes. So I had to change the exposure every time the lighting changed and it drove me insane. This ended up being the third shot that I got. The other 200 after this were complete garbage. And I, I'm really surprised that I even got this image. But like I said, this is what I imagined, slightly different than what I imagined, a bit closer, but it works and it works well. This was for a blog about the Meet Myrtle program where people can pay and come to feed Myrtle. They get to stand out here for an enormous price. Now this photo is, is technically not perfect. It's a little bit dark up here. There's backscatter, this particulate matter in the water. But ultimately, does that detract from the image? I don't think so. If it did, then it, it wouldn't be as great. And so this nice water line. And again, foreground subject, background, secondary subject, Mike O'Neill, one of the aquarium workers feeding Myrtle. And then you can also see outside of the tank, there's a whale skeleton that they have hanging, a person, a little bit of the coral reef, fabricated reef. And so for me, this was a heavily visualized image. I thought about this for a while. I didn't have long to take it, 20 minutes that I got to sit in the tank and very technically challenging. So for a lot of that, I was really frustrated, struggling. And I don't know how I even got this image, to be honest. It was very challenging, but I'm glad that it made it. Another time, this is in Monterey Bay right at the breakwater wall. I was at uh, the uh, Monterey shootout, which is hosted again by Backscatter, another photo competition. And there was a beautiful jellyfish uh, smack, a big uh, group of them. These are all sea nettles. And I, I, Monterey has some amazing diving, lots of marine life, a lot more than New England does. And it's really, really beautiful. This image of these swarming sea nettles was one that I really wanted to get. It's kind of that classic image. But visibility isn't always great. On this particular dive, it was like maybe 15 feet, so it was okay. 
And I pulled the stroke really far to the right side. I only lit this with one stroke. So I had a stroke way up here and I lit it in, just getting this bell of the sea nettle lit up. Cause I noticed that sometimes if you light these oral tentacles, these big ones here in the middle, a little bit too much, then they get kind of pink and a little bit too saturated. I'm not a huge fan of that. But this image for me was really, really special. And uh, a nice gradation, all having to do with the sun. So I timed this out so that I would get a nice gradation. This is about 50 feet here, sun up in the top. And this to me was perfect. This is one of the very rare instances in photography that I've put the camera down. I took this one image and I was done. The rest of the dive, I just sat there mesmerized by all these jellyfish swarming around me. Of course, I got stung a couple minutes later and it zapped me out of that. But so, again, visualizing, how do I make that even better? I've got a great image. How do I expand upon that? I can have them as a background. So I went down, there's a metridium field, these beautiful, beautiful metridium anemones, pure white underneath all of these sea nettles. So I wanted them as a background. And this was one of the earlier shots that I got and I, I really didn't like it. It's an okay shot, nice foreground, good, beautiful background, but what's it lacking? It's lacking a clear cut foreground. The subject's not isolated enough. So I ended up with this shot. I went back a couple days later and made this. And to me, this was perfect. I love this image. This is one of my favorite images. And even as these are some of the tentacles from the sea nettles that got stuck on this metridium. So it adds a little bit of a story to it. And these metridiums, you have to be a little bit careful, especially with bright white subjects using the strobes or a flash or anything to not overexpose them. So using that same vertical stroke position that I mentioned earlier, I cranked down the power a lot so that it doesn't overexpose it. And again, conceptually, what's this doing for the viewer? It's connecting this foreground with the background. It's showing it in a different way, in a way that they can connect with, see differently, and in an artistic way. Over the summer, the one good thing that the whole lockdown did for me is that I got to spend a lot of time in New Hampshire. My family has a little house up in New Hampshire in Greenfield. And I spent a lot of time swimming around in this lake, this small lake, very small, incredibly biodiverse. And snapping turtles were one of the subjects that I photographed a lot. I had never seen a snapping turtle before. I'd, all, I'd heard about them being there for the past 17 years, and I'd never seen one. But this summer, I went out almost every single day for three, four hours at a time. And I started seeing them. And to my surprise, they're incredibly docile underwater. This shot I got, this was the fifth encounter that I had with the snapping turtle. I named this one Smiley because it, it always looks like he's smiling. Some of the other ones are real grouchy looking. But this one is perfect subject. So I, I looked up some other images. I didn't see too many snapping turtle photos out there. Most of the ones that I saw were from the like crystal rivers in Florida or in the South. Not many from up around the Northeast and here. And so I really wanted to get a good image of them to show their story. So I spent every day trying to find them and I got to know them really well. I got to know them personally, their different personalities, I could identify a few of them. All of these are with uh, snorkeling or free diving. I didn't do any scuba for these because I can actually keep up with them if I'm on snorkel. Whereas if I have a big tank with me, then it's a little bit harder. I read in the one guidebook that snapping turtles are incredibly fast underwater. They're the only subject that I have ever been able to keep at the same speed with. To me, that's not, if I can swim at the same speed as it, then it's not that fast. But I haven't seen them in full throttle. But so when I encounter a subject like this that's not photographed very much, I want to get as many different images as possible. 
this for me was one of the best that I've gotten because it's at the surface. I haven't seen another image of snapping turtles at the surface like this. There might be, I'm not totally sure, but I really wanted to get this and it took a lot to gain the trust of this one turtle so that I could spend time with it at the surface. And again, this is with a fish eye. So I'm maybe half a foot away from this turtle. So very, very close. But I wanna get as many different shots as possible. So I get some of it sitting in a tree, a beautiful down tree hanging from the branch. This one in the bottom left-hand corner was during a torrential downpour. You can kind of see it at the top. This is a half a second shutter speed. And of course the strobes are lighting everything, stopping the motion a bit, but it, it really dragged it on. I needed that long exposure to get enough lighting. Then sitting down at around 15 feet underwater, you get this nice emeraldy green water. Same subject, four completely different images. Four more completely different images. This one I really have come to love is uh, surrounded by a whole school of little fish. I think these are young bass. Just in the school in and of itself, I was photographing for a while, was a really, really cool subject. I don't get nice big schools like this. Usually they're a little bit smaller. And so I was photographing them for maybe 20, 30 minutes. Then I look over to the side of me and there's a turtle just sitting there at the surface. Same turtle that I've been photographing. Then I get one from underneath, nice sun rays coming through, a little bit backed off, climbing over a log, get some nice natural lighting, and then a split shot as well. And these are just a small sample of some of the images that I've gotten of them because I spend a lot of time with them. I've got to know them really well as a subject. I've been able to understand their behavior and almost track them at a few points as well. Then this is one of my favorite images as well. This is a little bit younger one, a small one. Most of the other ones are pretty big. I'd estimate they weigh around 40, 50 pounds. They're pretty much fully grown. This guy's a little bit smaller. He's maybe about a foot long, maybe a little bit more. But this beautiful, beautiful reflection, you can only really get well when it's in shadows. And so I, I anticipated trying to get this image just like all the others. And when I see the scene, I try my best to get that image and make it as good as I can. So technically, how do I get this reflection? Well, the camera exposure, I expose the camera for the sky. So at that point, if I'm not shooting with strobes, all of this would be completely black underwater. But because I'm shooting with strobes, the strobes are lighting the turtle. And because it's directly at the surface, touching the surface on its back, it's lighting the reflection as well. And it's a really nice kind of artistic way to do that. Now, one thing that Minor White in his book, Mirrors, Messages and Manifestations talks about is this kind of concept of photographing not what's there, but what else is there. And I really love this idea. This is a photograph from Rhode Island in uh, Fort Wetherill, very mundane subject, a Forbes sea star. But to me, it wasn't just a sea star. It was a star in this galaxy, this kind of nebula of colors. And this is in bad vis. This is like two feet. You can see all the sediment getting kicked up, but I pulled the strobes way back, slowed the shutter speed down to get this ambient light. And it's conceptually a star in a galaxy. It's no longer a sea star in some seaweed. It's a star in a galaxy. Similarly in that lake again, to me, this isn't just a bunch of pickerel weed growing through the surface. It's an underwater forest. And this is maybe five inches below the surface. So really pushing the camera up in there. One of my favorite things to do with macro is to do abstracts of subjects. This is a moon snail, a voracious predator of the New England waters, constantly chasing after stuff. And very, very, very common. But I love this image because beautiful lines, nice leading lines, different textures. The texture is really what I wanted to get across. 
you have some algae in here, the texture of the foot, mantle, the shell, and the color. And it all comes together. And what does this do for the viewer? It shows them this uh, mundane subject in a completely different and interesting way to push it into a different realm. Similarly, this is a squid. I, got, I made this photo last week, in, again in Rhode Island. And I've been waiting and waiting to get this photo for a while. I've been trying to find the right cooperative squid that I could get really close to. This is only maybe four inches away from it. And this is just its back. All the chromatophores, the color changing cells on it. And this beautiful iridescent streak. Here it's red, red, and then all white in the middle. Okay. And the color changing cells, the chromatophores, will expand and contract. So on the red, they're expanded. And then in the lighter parts, they're contracted a little bit smaller. And this beautiful iridescence, again, it, it becomes a leading line, goes directly from corner to corner. This I, I made in Boston Harbor, Constitution Marina. Mucky, dirty, kind of gross waters. This is just on a chain off a marina and filled with life. This is a skeleton shrimp climbing a tunicate, but to me, it wasn't. It was a little mountain climber underwater and I'm lighting it with a snoot to just light the subject matter, to isolate it, to create this really nice composition that's striking. This is, a, it's a good photo, it's not a great photo, but what I really love about this photo is the color. If you're thinking right now, wow, that's a really, really blue sun star, then I've done my job successfully as a photographer. I've tricked you into thinking that. Because in reality, it's purple. Underwater color limits. So after 30 feet, red doesn't exist and it goes so on through the visible light spectrum. Quite frankly, I didn't like it, it has purple, so I just turned off the right strobe and I lit this side with the left strobe so that it kind of tricks the viewer into thinking that it's lit with strobe and that this is the actual color. This is down about 80 feet in Newfoundland on the wreck. This is the wreck of the PLM 27 shot down in World War II by German U-boats. But as you can see, a little bit of the light is kind of bleeding over, so you get a little bit of purple over here, but it works really well. This is another one of my favorite images. This is on a different wreck, also in Newfoundland. This is on the Saganaga. And to me, it was this kind of split shot underwater, this kind of half and half world. These are just very common subject, starfish, sea urchin, an anemone, frilled anemone. And this is part of the wreck that's broken either by a torpedo or one of the icebergs that might have hit that go through in the winter time. Again, technically isolating the subject in the lower third, nice negative space. And compositionally, it's like a split shot, but underwater. This for me, uh, green moray and Roatan was one of the first instances that I, I really got to experience a kind of bond with a subject underwater. I spent every day going out and finding this one moray. Everyone else would go on the boats and I would shore dive. And I went and visited this moray every day. I'd wave to it. And one day I decided to spend the entire dive with it. This is around 65 feet. And you wouldn't know it looking at the photo, but the camera's actually pointed directly up. So this is a big reef wall and the camera's underneath the moray. And I, I waited 40 minutes or so with this eel gaining its trust. I'd inch in, it would inch back into its hole. I'd move back, it would come out a little bit and eventually I got it so that I could be close to it and it would be almost out of its hole. And this is around a four foot moray eel, most of it's in this little hole, but I just gained its trust. And it came out and bam, shoot the strobes, nice composition. It's isolated in this 
beautiful negative space of black. Then you also have a different negative space of blue, the water column. And it's very, very, very little strobe lighting for this to get that nice, soft, even light across the subject. And so this was one of the first images that I really realized what it means to make an image and to make a successful image as purposeful. So thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, well, Jake, I think we have a lot of questions. So, All right. um, but uh, because uh, uh, I'm one of the moderators, I'm gonna ask the first question because that's my privilege. <laughs> so um, my question is, I really, really appreciated how you used quotes uh, from Minor White, White and uh, you, know, you referenced his book. And I guess my question is, uh, how much does uh, photography that's not underwater influence your work? A lot. Uh, some of my favorite photographers like uh, Sebastio Salgado, Robert Frank, a lot of their work is black and white, beautiful prints, and especially in print and book form. I, I've been collecting a lot of photo books recently because I learn a lot more from them. And, you know, I try to take some technical and compositional aspects of street photography or landscape into the underwater world and try to combine them. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's all just trial and error. But you know, really studying all different kinds of photography helps with everything. I even look at fashion photography sometimes to learn lighting for different portraits of animals. Yeah. Yep. So I'm going to try to get to the questions here as they came in. So if uh, for our audience, if you asked a question, I'm going to do my best to get to it. But I think the first question that came in wasn't in the Q&A, but it was in the chat. And um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Uh, Ron uh, Watkins asked, um, how can he get on a dive trip with you? <laughs> Ron is a good friend of mine. So I'd be happy to dive with you anytime, Ron. <laughs> um, do you ever do guided dives? I haven't done any guided dives. I mean, I'm always open to go diving at any point. So in New England, especially. Yeah. All right. So I, um, I want to bring okay. up, Andre, I'd like to actually sure. just bring up one thing that, um, that, you know, kind of how Jake and I got connected, reconnected and kind of talking about this is that, um, all of your photographs are are out uh, are amazing, and for those of us that don't get to dive as much, or even for those who don't dive at all, you know, one of the things that Jake is working on is um, launching a, a photo print um, opportunity through his website, which is how we got connected. And um, you know, his his so all of all of or much of Jake's work is going to be available for sale, and we'll post a link to his uh, site through Photo Shelter. Um, but one of the things that Jake and I talked about in terms of this was um, utilizing a, a really good fine art paper that would give, you know, cr uh, you know, uh, what was the word? really good quality paper that would sort of match his really beautiful images. So we've actually started working with um, Hannah Mule has a brand new paper out, uh, a few papers that are part of their natural line. And we've selected this paper called agave. It's a beautiful matte paper, but it's also in terms of the environmental impact, it has one of the lowest impacts in production of making that paper. So to sort of match up with Jake's beautiful environmental images, like he said in his, in his, uh, in his presentation, how important it is for us to sort of connect to the environmental world and the impact we're having on it, we are using a paper that uh, in production is um, has minimal impact. So if some of you uh, are interested in Jake's work, Andrea just posted his website there at photoshelter.com and uh, strongly encourage you to think about um, ordering some prints they, you know, for yourself or, you know, the holidays are coming up. I mean, some of these photographs are beautiful and otherworldly. I mean, I just can't you know, all, so many of them, uh, even the, and I, forgive me for not remembering Jake, but the image of those two white looking, um, undersea creatures that, you know, with all, 
with all the jellyfish in the background, they, they would just look like these beautiful um, co white columns, you know, that are just, and the strength that they have. So yeah, uh, just want to remind people that in, in, in part of, uh, of, of the beautiful work here, you can support Jake and, and, uh, and, and, and enjoy some of his photographs more long term by putting them up on your, uh, up on your uh, wall. And I also want to add that if you're, it seems like we have a lot of divers in the, uh, that have joined us today and um, hey, make some prints. I know that's kind of a shameless plug, but uh, it's really great to see that work up on a wall and presented. Um, so I want to get on to some other questions here. Um, so Julian asked, uh, how much do you look at the picture you've just taken when underwater? Uh, whenever I'm editing, I'm always thinking, man, I didn't see that there was that this problem or that problem. If I only noticed and adjusted it. Um, so I guess the question is, how much time do you take to review images when you're actually in a dive or during a dive? During the dive, some, sometimes if it's shallow, you got a lot of time. It's easy. But if you're doing deeper dives past 100 feet, you might not have that time, especially if you have you're on air or something, not using nitrox, whatever. And so you got to spend a lot of time, like I said, visualizing images. And so a lot of times I'll go into dives with images that I have visualized and try to execute them. If I find a subject that I wasn't planning on, then I'll look at the scene, first of all, for maybe 20, 30 seconds. I'll get the strobes in the position I want, mm -hmm. and then I'll approach the scene I'll look at it, I, and sometimes I, I don't have a prescription mask, so I don't always see that great underwater. But sometimes, I feel I'm, yeah. <laughs> sometimes one thing that's really important, I find is repeatability. Especially diving in New England, I can go back and shoot the same subject a lot, but we don't always have that option. And so sometimes I'll have a subject that I don't, know very well and i'll just try to approach it the best way possible and if it doesn't work out then i'll edit it a little bit i don't do a ton of editing usually i try to get the best image possible in camera first i'm not a huge fan of over editing and so a lot of that really comes down to just visualizing images beforehand mm -hmm. and um, uh, kind of since i want to maybe add it a little uh add on to that question. What do you use for post-production? I use uh, Photoshop and Lightroom. In, uh, in Lightroom, I go through, I bring all the photos into Lightroom. I look through every single image, no matter how many images I have. One time I spent a whole day going through a, a trip I did, I had over 10,000 images. And so I, I look through every single image. And for me, the editing process is more of self-reflecting and trying to see what I could do differently the next time. Okay, Eric, did you want to ask something? Yeah, just uh, another fellow Cantabrigian and, and friend of mine, Angelica Brisk, um, who's also a teacher at Ringing Latin, uh, asked about how much do you think researching your subjects helps you create better images? Certainly researching is very important. Uh, certain subjects I know fairly well, especially if they're New England, but like the snapping turtles, I had no clue what their behavior was like. So I did a lot of research and some of the sites said they were pretty docile. Some of them I found were actually kind of wrong about that they can be aggressive underwater. I, I didn't find that at all. So I found some conflicting information. And so a lot of research I do about life history, about biology of the animals, when to find them, where to find them. But then the behavioral stuff, which I find a little bit more important, I usually try to figure out underwater. That's great. So um, I think the next question here, uh, Rick asked, and I'm gonna kind of condense this question a little bit if I can. So Rick, forgive me if I don't get it exactly right. But Rick's using a GoPro 8, and he says he's using two big blue torches. and. Uh, he asks um, that he's getting a lot of backscatter at night, especially in his night photography. And what's the best way for him to reduce that, you know, kind of given the set mm -hmm. that he's using two strobes? 
Uh, certainly pulling the strobes out to the side is just the easiest thing to do. Pulling them back a little bit reduces backscatter a lot. Especially in New England, we have a lot of backscatter. I found that sometimes it's helpful to just shoot with one strobe. Sometimes I'll pull it up to the side so that the particles aren't reflecting back into the camera, but they're reflecting to the side. And so it's just playing around with it a lot. Each dive is different. Sometimes there's current that's moving it up in the column. Sometimes it's flat. And so, yeah, first of all, I would pull them back. If that doesn't work, then pull one up to the side, both up to the side. You can do some overhead. Uh, compositionally, it doesn't always work, but angling the camera down a little bit, you're not shooting into the water column as much, so you get less backscatter. So that can work sometimes, not always though. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there was a question earlier uh, in the chat question and someone asked about if you could go in and I just kind of want to field this one, maybe ask you Jake what you think, but somebody asked, you know, uh, the question came in after you had the little diagram for your turtle dive, you know, at the aquarium. Sure. And I know that noticed you'd put down uh, ISO and f-stop and someone asked if you could explain that more in depth and I think there are lots of good tutorials on ISO and f-stop uh, yeah. online it's kind of a lengthy subject so that would be my response Jake do you have anything you want to add to that I, I, I'd agree with that there's a lot of good books YouTube videos about that underwater it's the exact same as above water. it's just you've just got to manage it differently and so you just kind of play with it, figure out what works, what doesn't work. Um, I have a question about just, you know, looking at your photography, because I don't know how people deal with this, but, um, you know, it seems to me like when you're, if you're taking shots and then, you know, looking at them on your, on your view, on the viewfinder in the back and, and taking another, um, how are you anchoring yourself on the bottom or wherever you are? So you're, you're not moving as much with the current, like what, what do you do to stay in place? to get, you know, take one look, take another one look. I mean, how are you managing that? So certainly dive skills are really important for underwater photography. And one of the most important is buoyancy, obviously. And so you want to be usually neutrally buoyant. For some New England dives, there's a little bit more current. And so I'll add a couple extra pounds. So yeah. I'll be a little bit heavier. So I don't move as much. Uh, you can also a lot of times have a, like a pointer stick you can hold on to one part of the ground or something without disturbing anything. You can just kind of float there. A lot of times too, like if I'm in a kind of enclosed area, I'll take a photo and then back off, look at the photo, then go back in. Thank you. Okay, um, so it's funny. I, if you hear a background noise, I have my wife is in a Zoom uh, session right now too at their university. So sorry about that. But um, so uh, kind of to add on to the question about post-production and post-processing, how much of that do you actually do? Do you do a little or a lot? What's your theory? Most photos I'll add a little bit of contrast to. I, I like high contrast images. So I'll do that for most images. The majority of the images that I showed today are not really edited that much. I think less is more all the time. I have a love-hate relationship with editing. I think if editing is used as a crutch for good photography, then it's not good. Mm. I think if it's used to push the photo to what you want, and so you can get an idea of what that is, then it's perfect. Uh, so uh, Kat, uh, I think Kat's our friend from Hawaii, asked, um, and I think that Eric, you can answer this question. What's the best file parameters to send in underwater pics for prints? Um, and she actually says that would be a great future session. She says I, she has a lot of pictures, so yeah. no idea where to start. So how would you respond to Kat? Um, I, I think with any photographer, whether you're underwater or on land, I think um, you know starting to take a look at your work and thinking about editing and um, you know, making pictures for print is important. Obviously, one of the key things that we always recommend people if they're thinking about printing is to invest in a, um, a calibrator for your monitor. They're, they're inexpensive. You can look at X-Rite or um, what's the other one, Andrea? Data color. 
data color. They both make them. The, they start at about $150, maybe $200. But if you really want to start sharing your work and enjoying it more in print, um, that investment is well worth it because calibration is probably the most important thing. And I can imagine anyone who's in photography here has probably sent a file off or made a print. And then you look at it next to your monitor and you think, this doesn't look right. The print is darker. That really has to do with calibration. And um, that's a super important part of the process, Kat, when you, when you begin to do that. And then in terms of file prep, um, you know, we, uh, we recommend that the file is always at 300 uh, PPI or DPI, uh, you know, in terms of resolution. Um, and, you know, we have information and, and recommendations on our website for exporting files out of Lightroom. So if you go to our website, um, we, we definitely have information on that. And um, like your suggestion on, uh, on exporting files and, and doing that. And I know that uh, uh, we might bring Jake back for that as well. And, um, and then there's a woman um, who works with Backscatter a lot. Um, Quigley, is that her last name, Jake? Aaron? Aaron Quigley. Yeah, so Erin Quigley, we've we've talked to her about you know doing a um, a seminar with her, and um, she works a lot with Berkeley uh, at Backscatter, which is a great dive outfit, and uh, I know I think they have a location on the East Coast in New Hampshire, and they have one on the West Coast as well. So um, great suggestion, Kat, and uh, by all means, if you have any other general questions, please reach out to us here at the lab at digitalsilverimaging.com. And also, yeah, that's, you can always call us. We're a very small outfit and we love to talk to our customers. So you can always give us a call. Um, but I just want to get to a couple more questions here because I think we're kind of running long on time. And um, so I have a question about snoots. And uh, that is with the snoot, should I start with the big circle or the smaller one? That's a great question. Um, I kind of cheat. I bring an assistant along with me on dives to hold the snoot. So I, I, I shoot with the uh, Retra LSD, which is a beautiful, beautiful snoot because it gives you a nice angled beam. And um, with the strobe focusing light, you can see that beam and it's perfect. So I usually start a bit bigger. I don't usually go down to really, really, really small sizes for the hole. And I don't mess around with any like the uh, double holes or triangles and stuff. I don't usually do that. I, I like the clean circle. Yeah. But yeah, so if you have a buddy who's willing to just sit with you, I usually just hand them this uh, snoot with the strobe on it. And then I tell them where to place it. I've devised a bunch of hand signals for different power levels and strobe angles and stuff. And so I, I kind of communicate with them through that. And then just try to figure out what works best. Most subjects, though, larger is a little bit better because you can always reduce it in Photoshop if you have to. But I, I find that I haven't had to at all. Yep. Excellent. I think pretty much I'm kind of scanning through all the questions and I'm going through the chat. I think that we've pretty much answered uh, all the questions, which is impressive because there were a bunch. Some of them were overlapping. So I, I kind of combined one. a couple. There was so, one I like, Andrea, if I could yeah. add that one in. Just, sure. I think this is important, which is somebody was asking how you balance when oh. you're diving in these exotic places. Um, you know, uh, and this is from Patrick. And Patrick, this is a good question. How do you, you know, I think this is true of anybody. If you go to one of these unique dives, how are you balancing kind of the focusing of, uh, the, of, a, of the photography you're doing with kind of the beauty and the uniqueness of the area you're in? And um, I, I mean, I can tell you as a photographer when I've traveled on land and I get to places um, that, you know, that's, that's complicated. Sometimes you have to go do the touristy thing and look at the sites and then plan on going back when the lighting is just right. Uh, so I can say that from a, a land perspective. And I wonder what Jake would say from an underwater perspective. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. I like, particularly for me, like the images I got in Monterey, the thing I really love, two things were the emerald green color of the water, beautiful. And then in the kelp forest, I love the, the kind of growing vertically. So I did a lot of vertical shots because the oh, kelp forest has vertical energy. And so a lot of that kind of translated into the photography. And a, place like New England where I'm 
comfortable diving and shooting, conditions and watercolor can change constantly. Mm. And so it, you kind of manage it on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, when I haven't done a ton of tropical stuff. Roatan has been pretty much the only tropical that I've done. But um, like with, with that, warm water, nice, clear. So you have a lot of range to do anything you want, really. And the thing that I liked was the beauty of the coral reef. I'd never been on a coral reef before, and this was a really healthy one. So like with that moray eel shot shooting up against the reef wall, to get that as the backdrop can be really interesting. So using the environment as a subject itself can be really fun. And I was doing that a lot in New England as well. Photographing just kelp or plants and stuff or just the lighting and the sun rays coming through to bring the environment as its own subject. That's great. I had a question for you, Jake, just this is my own question. Um, uh, actually, just on a comment, I think your work on the snapping turtle kind of reminded me of that documentary, My Octopus Teacher. Mm. Uh, <laughs> this is kind of, but um, uh, so uh, it's kind of about your approach and and what you take to uh, a, to a photograph. So, do you specifically go out with the intention of? adding to a specific body of work, you're like, you know, this time of year, I'm gonna be doing, you know, like nudibranchs or whatever it is. Yeah, um, the freshwater series that I did in the Hampton, the snapping turtles are just one small part of that. I did a really big series of work and I'm continuing it of just that lake, trying to show the story of that lake. But like the nudibranchs in particular, they're only around in the winter time and only in one site for those specific ones up in, uh, Pierce Island, Portsmouth, in New Hampshire. And so you kind of, kind of uh, figure out different ways to shoot stuff, different lighting. Every once in a while, I'll bring a wide angle and photograph the scenery, which for new to Brinks, wide angle doesn't work that great, but it works to get the whole scene. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there is some projects and some series that I work on. And then there's other times that I'm just photographing one subject that I like, that I want to get a really good image of, but especially with the snapping turtle images, that's a whole series in and of itself within a series. Mm -hmm. And one, and we got another question while you were answering my question. Keith asks, what strength lights do you use uh, for photo and video? Uh, I use the, CNC YSD2 strobes. I don't do much video, if, if really any, and I, I should try video at some point, but my skill sets lie more with photography, but I do have um, Solas, uh, I think they're 2500 lumen. I, I never put them to the full power. I like pretty laid back lighting because you don't want to flood the whole scene with too much light. But yeah, so that's what I use for strobes and lights and a pair of each of them. Oh, all right, well, I think that this has been a really tremendous presentation, Jake. I really thoroughly enjoyed it, honestly. Um, it's probably the one of the best ones we've had. Um, so, you know, kudos to you. Thank you very much for being on with us. And um, also a big thank you to everyone uh, who joined us today. And I, I wanna remind everybody that, um, uh, we are a very good printing lab, and uh, <laughs> that's our bread and butter, and that's one of the reasons we put on these presentations. But so we ask you to stay subscribed to our uh, email list because we hope to have presentations on all kinds of subjects. I think that's one of the very positive things that's resulted from uh, the unfortunate pandemic is that the webinars uh, are turning out to be a really great resource. And we will post this webinar on our YouTube channel, it'll probably be, be up there tomorrow. Um, so you can more than, we're more than happy to have you share it with your friends. Um, and again, Eric, do you have anything else that you wanna say before we wrap this up? No, uh, Jake, I have to second Andrea's comment. I, you, your presentation is outstanding. And I have to say for, you know, for a young man, uh, you're incredibly articulate. Um, 
you're entertaining. Um, you know a lot about photography for a gentleman who's only started, you know, you've been photographing for, I think you said since you were 10 or nine, but, uh, but that combined with the technical part of scuba diving is, um, is, is yeah. really inspirational. Mm -hmm. I have to say, you really, um, I really want to encourage me to, to get back in the water with my son, who I'm going to share this video with and, uh, really impressed with what, what you have done. And, um, so, you know, just again, thank you for joining us today and we'd love to do another one with you. And uh, I would encourage you to take people out on, on dive trips because I think you're an excellent, I, I, I see you as an excellent teacher. And, uh, you yeah. know, I really think that you can, um, you know, I'd like to learn your hand signals and learn from you. So that's, uh, that's you know, but again, just to reiterate, you know. Be careful what you ask for in hand <laughs> signals there, Eric. <laughs> But to all of our listeners and, and watchers, um, we hope, you know, you'll, you'll come to us when you have printing questions. You know, you've gone to think about these exotic places you've gone to and how fun it is to put a few of those up on your wall to share with people, you know, bigger than a monitor um, or a handheld device. And you get to really appreciate these wonderful places that we get to go to as divers. So again, thank you, everybody. Um, we wish you all the safety and health and uh, a good uh, weekend coming up and uh, look forward to seeing you all in another, uh, another event. And Jake, uh, thanks again for your great work. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. All right. Take care, everybody.